are you buying the wrong properties at the wrong time in your life and where you're at in your property portfolio? Hi, I'm Joe Krause. And I'm Sam Powell, and we're the hosts of Property Powell's Australia. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing the pros and cons of buying capital growth properties in Australia. We also talk about the pros and cons of buying high cash flow properties in Australia as well. And when to buy high capital growth properties and when to buy high cash flow properties during the different phases of your, your life and also what's best for your property portfolio. Yeah, we go into what good capital growth properties look like, um, what you know, what those ones are to purchase and also what good cash flow properties are um, and what they look like to purchase as well. Yeah, the, the, like the relationship between buying and owning different residential properties and commercial properties, um, as well as a good part that we, we touch on in assessing your opportunity costs with, with each of those. So uh, I hope you get a lot out of it. But as always, before um, we get stuck in the episode, we, we do want to share with you, obviously, our How to Maximize Your Borrowing Capacity uh, mini course. It's on our website. So head over to propertypals.au forward slash resources. We put together this this guide to really help you uh, maximise your your cash flow in that um, in your portfolio to help you grow it and get a better ROI. Welcome to Property Pals, the podcast where we share everything around how to build a property portfolio, from researching areas, financing, structuring, buying, selling, and reinvesting to live a life of financial independence. As a disclaimer, any information shared by myself, Jared, Sam, and the Property Pals team is strictly general and should not be taken as constituting professional advice. You should consider seeking independent legal, financial, and taxation advice from a qualified professional. This is quite funny because I was just reading the title of what we're going to talk about and uh, it being cash flow versus capital growth, which is best and why, and uh, you just didn't even think. You just said cash flow. <laughs> no, it's capital growth. Yeah. Really <laughs> well, <laughs> got you. Really Pull me into that one. <laughs> I, 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 believe, I believe so. Um, however, there is a time and a place for both. Yes. And, um, that's what we're going to be delving into today to help people. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about the, the pros and cons of capital growth and the pros and cons of cash flow. Um, and yeah, and then we'll move into the different phases of, of our life, where we're at in our life, and also where we're at in our property portfolio, which one suits and, you know, the mixture of both and the yin and yang of it both, I guess. Yeah. Um, so if you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. Maybe yeah, even your 60s. 60s and 70s even. Oh, you know, like, 70s kind of get a bit old. To, oh, come on. To invest in property. What? I don't know if banks will lend you it in your 70s, man. Well, you could still you could still be making a decent cash flow. Yeah, yeah, and, true. And, you know, like if you're getting a couple of hundred K a year cash flow from some commercials or a big chunk of resis, like, don't yeah. you reckon? Well, probably more so the seven-year-olds you buying in trusts and you're doing it yeah um, you're buying more cash or and you should probably should be just buying like some six sports cars and stuff like that right like <laughs> going on holidays and yeah, spending yeah. your money versus just the making of it yeah well i guess you flip into the uh this is good actually yeah, when you're into the <laughs> your 70s and 80s not that i'm obviously not there but i do have um you know family members and mentors that are in their older um ages and mm. yeah you worked your whole life you know Go and enjoy it. That's now's the time. I mean, you can't take it with you. It depends what lights you up. If your sports car does, or if it's yeah, you know, buying your kids' first car to each their own. You might not have kids, <laughs> so you can probably. Do you reckon when we're in our seventies, we'll be still frothing buying properties? Like I reckon I'll still be stoked to be buying deals, like buying businesses and, and properties and stuff. I think it's. I don't know. Maybe I'm just an oddball, and I just like get a bit of a kick out of it. No, it's your purpose. Like it's it's something to do too, and uh, even a lot a lot of uh, people when they're into that retirement phase, they got their self managed super. Mm. You know, they get really into the stocks and the shares and reading about it yeah. um, because it is fascinating, and also it's it's the game of it all. It's like why gambling is so popular. People put their money, um, and they they back themselves with their thought process, and it's you know, I. Stock trading is similar to gambling to me, unless you're educated. 
even property um, investing is gambling in a way um, because you, there's a risk there. Life's a gamble though, right? Like crossing the street can be a gamble. Yeah. Choosing who you hang out with, who to podcast with, that's whoa, a gamble. Whoa, that's, that's a big gamble. <laughs> well, who you spend your time with is a gamble. Yeah, your net works, your net worth, and all that kind of Damn, stuff. Damn, we're getting deep. We yeah. haven't even got to like the topic of topic at hand here. Yeah, <laughs> actually a good point. Uh, so <laughs> bring it all back. So Yeah, pros and cons of capital growth. Yeah, uh, well, let's jump into it. So uh, pros and cons of capital growth. You want to start there? Yeah, so let's start with the pros. What do you think? I think the pros is you get, uh, like by buying capital growth, you get faster growth in your portfolio at the start because you're able to secure, if you're buying like high capital growth property, it's if this is in residential light, <clears throat> I'm, I'm referring to, not commercial. Uh, maybe we do talk about commercial a little bit in, in this one, or maybe we just stick with Resi, but... We go um, hand in hand. In yeah, way. okay. Well, if, if I'm buying something that's a high capital growth area, uh, typically the property is going to outgrow uh, or it's going to make me more in value than what I will be getting back from net profit and rent. So at the start of the journey, the pros would be going for uh, capital growth to get faster growth. Am I correct? Correct. Cool. Well done. Past, hey. past. Yeah, it's like going back to school. <laughs> yeah. I felt like I was on the spot there too. <laughs> yeah, it's always me talking, but it's good for. Um, yeah, I want to ask you some questions. All right, that. let's go. Yeah, so let's well capital growth. Uh, you're you're bang on. Um, the reason why I jumped at capital growth first was is because that's your portfolio growth is really important to draw equity out in future stages to help you make those deposits for future purchases so you're not constantly putting your own cash into it and uh, for the, the cash flow perspective it's uh, well the capital growth if you're making what 100 bucks a week which is a really strong cash flow property at this stage residential yeah yeah that's five grand a year roughly okay. yeah that's pretty good hey yeah. especially in this market that we're in now yeah, that's that's like from, from a asset that actually is going to grow in value as well with that mm -hmm. cash flow, which is important. You should never buy for just cash flow. Yeah, um, I like where you're going with this example here because it, it emphasizes like my what I, my point on the growth. Yeah, so five grand in cash flow, well done. However, if your asset from a even a, the standard five hundred thousand dollar purchase, if that goes at five percent, that's twenty five grand. You, yeah, that's five x your your cash flow component, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know the Australian average growth rate sits at six to eight, six to seven, six to eight uh, percent. Um, in the growth markets that we're buying in, obviously it outperforms that, but um, you know conservatively, it's being very conservative, like six percent or five, six to seven. Yeah. I said five percent, right? Yeah, you're, you're super conservative, which which we like. It's a value of mindset. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's good though because you under promise and over deliver. Oh yeah, it's got yeah. My, my, or, or I, uh, I'm too much of a hard ass, and I only want the best properties. So. You are a hard ass, but that's why. That's why I like to use you. <laughs> <laughs> see, see good value, and it gets you excited. Yeah. Uh, where we actually went there was an auction yesterday, and uh, there was this beachfront apartment up at Sunshine Coast, and uh, I was, I said a million and seventy five would be what it goes for, and it went from one million one hundred thirty five. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, missed out on that one, but um, uh, still but they, was pretty close. They paid, what, 75 to 35? Yeah, so they paid an extra 70K, basically. Oh, let's see the figures on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 60, 65 grand, yeah. which is good. Uh, but, like, yeah, from a percentage basis, that's kind of bang on where I want to be. Like, uh, I think it, it wasn't overpaying by any means. But um, when you th when you think about that, and we talked about this in the previous episode. If you buy a um, a property with like you know it's going to go in value, and you're a bit emotional about it, some people are happy to overpay, right? Mm -hmm. So they've overpaid by say sixty grand. And if you look at the capital growth of that property, so what was it? One zero. It was a million and what? It was one million one hundred thirty five is what it sold for. Yeah. Okay. And then you. What what sort of growth rate would you say is on that? Oh, it's, it's close to the beach, so I can give you easy eight percent. 
so compounding per annum on a ten year basis. So so after a year, you're gonna the value of the property is gonna go up ninety grand. So they basically that's on average, you know, based on an eight percent growth rate. So that means they paid you know sixty extra grand. So they paid an extra in time in market, an extra what seven or eight months of yeah. what the property would be worth. So it's actually not too. Is that a fair way to like think about it? Do you ever think about it that way? That's just how how my head goes into like if I'm just going to overpay the market a little bit just to secure it. How many how many like what's what sort of growth am I stealing from myself by overpaying a little bit of the market? You know, is it is it ten months growth or seven months growth or something? Well, even the market value so that was an option, so it was live, and there was multiple bidders that bid it up to that one million one hundred thirty five thousand. So that is the true reflection of market value because you've yeah. got a number of other parties right. actually willing to pay. I think it was three parties involved over one point one million dollars and ended up running um, to that million thirty five. So that's the definition of market value. So technically, I'm not stealing future growth for myself because I'm paying market value. No, it just means, yeah. it means that I was conservative with million seventy five, and I need to get to my act together and put a bit more money on the table. Yeah, but you know, I just used comparable evidence. There was multiple different factors. You know, searching different coastlines, and for those niche assets, which was you know. A block back from the beach, northeast facing, top floor apartment, no lift, very very scarce, but highly desirable, and also undesirable in that no one wants to walk four flights of stairs. Mm -hmm. But it's um, developers love that kind of stuff too. So how um, how many bedrooms? Bathrooms? Three bed, two bath. It was really good, three yeah. bed, two bath on the beach, sunny coast, and it's only one eleven hundred. Yeah, what well, one point one? That's that's awesome, hey. Yeah, it was. I, now I'm reflecting. I'm like, probably should have put a bit more. Let's not tell people how good the, how good Queensland is because we're just going to get way more people moving up here. <laughs> it is great. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so cap, 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 grow. Cap, grow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go back. So, uh, yeah. So twenty. You're gonna instead of like the growth, the cash flow of five grand a year, which is amazing um, in net profit, you can get twenty five k. Um, in extra value on the property from capital growth on, a, say, a five hundred thousand uh, dollar property. Yeah. So that's that's the pros, right? Is there other pros as well? Like that can that can help you with your borrowing capacity, I guess, because you got the value of your property has gone up. You could possibly take equity out, mm -hmm. and it could help you with borrowing capacity to go again. This is the main reason I like at the start of my game is is, is going for capital growth so I can get more borrowing capacity. Yeah, and. What I also like to look at is is the psychological side of the buyer. So if you see your property increasing in value, it gives you more confidence and it makes you sleep at night uh, a little bit more. So when things do you know, happen, say you have to replace a hot water system or you know you need to replace your carpet or something like that, it's not that big of a deal because you're like, well, I'm happy to spend a few hundred or a few thousand dollars because. I bought this property for five hundred thousand yeah, dollars. It's yeah, now valued at really six hundred thousand dollars. I did nothing. I literally just paid a few bills. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's a huge, that's a huge psychological gain as a buyer for capital growth properties. That's cool. What else have we got on the? I mean, there's some pretty significant pros. Have we got other other ones that we should dive into, or should we stick with the big well, significant ones? Yeah, capital growth too is it helps you. Um, you know, understand the appetite risk uh, for you know, your, your future. So, mm. what I mean by that is, if you're got, a, if you have an asset that is increased in value, it doesn't owe you anything. You know, worst case scenario, and everything goes to the wall, you can sell it for a profit, move on. You know, it was a profitable exercise. Mm. That's why capital growth is really important because you can go the cash flow route, and you know, you're getting paid per week, and that feels great. Um, I guess we'll jump into the pros of, of that one next, but um, you know, there, there is a balance, but also capital growth is not for everybody because if you're in your latter stages of, of your life, like basically 50 plus, yeah, you so don't. I shouldn't say that latter, it, like you, <laughs> if you're in the latter stage of your working life, which hopefully is 50 to 70, mm. you know, that capital growth is, is great. Um, however, cash flow is more important for those people because they're getting closer to retirement. They don't have the that they don't want to, um, they they don't want to like, they don't want to play the long game because they you know don't have the long game. <laughs> They're not in the stage for the long game, right? 
Yeah, they different s- mindsets, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely both. Uh, and there's people like, oh, I'm going to live to 100. Like, that's yeah. that's in my conscious 100%. mind. That's how I feel. Let's do it. We put it out there. Let's both live to 100. Yeah, you're surfing to, what, 80? Yeah, 80. 80. 80. 80. Oh, it was 70. I was like, oh, I can definitely do 80. Yeah, let's do that too. Yeah, all right. We'll just we'll timestamp be... this episode. Yeah. So, <laughs> what is it, 20-something? 20 2022. No, it's 2023. 2023. Yeah. Okay. So hold us to it, team, everyone. How far away is that? We, we'll, we'll put our age out there. So that's well, 35 years. Yeah. No. No, that's 45, 45 years. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even lived 45 years. We've got 45 years, years of surfing left. How is that? Yeah, it'll be that old guy with a Malibu just cruising. <laughs> I'll probably have a motor on my surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what I created. On the craft or something in the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Or just digitally surfing. Yeah. 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 No, the natural stuff. Hopefully, we own our own wave pool then or something. Oh, that would be rad. Yeah. Imagine that. Like, yeah. like it's just so accessible that people have wave pools. That'll be our commercial. Backyard. That'll be our big commercial property investment together. Yeah, yeah but that wave pool in Melbourne, that's expensive thing yeah, to run out. It is high maintenance. Hopefully, in 30 years, they work it out. We're getting <laughs> cheaper. <laughs> point. All right. So, some cons to capital growth. Yeah, I guess they sort of go like you <coughs> what we're saying. A, yeah. a few of them there. Um, you're playing a longer game. You, you're not getting. Um, yeah. yeah, you're not getting a higher return of cash fast. No, and with if you're just so let's go into the your major CBD markets, say Sydney, where you, your cash flow yield it's you're highly negatively geared. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need to basically sack up, and if you're on a you know eighty percent loan to value ratio. You're going to be taking a haircut on that um, from a cash perspective, so it's costing you money to hold this asset. You do so in the proviso that you're making money essentially in the growth of the property. Mm. So that's the that's the investment, right? You're putting two hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars a week into this asset on the proviso that it's going to grow more in value per week than what you're putting into it. Yeah, um, over the long term. Um, what that the cons of the capital growth strategy is that you hinder your borrowing capacity for future events because it's costing you more to hold. Yeah, it's taking money out of your pocket, more yeah. money out of your pocket. Yeah. And it can be a stress on your lifestyle in that you know if you are spending four hundred bucks a week to hold a, a property, you know, what's your household income? Um, you know, and a lot of people do sort of get um, caught with. You know, higher cost of living or the lifestyle creep, they call it. Yep. You, you want the new car, you want the new house, you, you want this persona of your, you know, where you see your life and you don't want to hold that asset so you sell it and don't sell property in within a six to ten year period um, is because it costs a lot of money to buy mm-hmm. and to sell and the transaction costs. So um, there are your real cons of, if you're just looking for capital growth, You've got to understand. You're in for the long game, eh? Yeah, and and what 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 is your income level, like mm-hmm. outside of your property portfolio, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. yeah, are you able to earn enough to put some money into into that property per week and still not affect your borrowing capacity to go for another one? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What what's your big goals? What's your age? What's your risk appetite? All this is really important, and you know, why we always lead with strategy. Yeah. Before we continue today's pod. I want to ask you a few questions. What is your property investment goal? What type of properties do you want to own? How many? What size valuation property portfolio do you want to own? And how much net income do you want to be earning? Essentially, what's your magic number in passive income that you want to be earning? And do you know how to get there? And if you do, do you know how to get there in the least time possible with the least amount of risk? Sam and I have been helping people invest in property and build property portfolios for years. People who are now replacing their income through property, and we want to help you do the same. Right now, for a limited time, we are offering free property coaching to our listeners. We won't be able to do this forever, of course, so head to propertypals.au forward slash coaching. That's propertypals.au forward slash coaching to see how we can help you achieve your investment property goals. Link will be in the description too. Any other cons on the capital growth? No, not really. I mean... I mean, I mean, the con would be is not investing in the right capital growth area. Yeah, knowing where where, where to go because um, it's sort of similar. You're, you're putting that money; it's the opportunity cost. Mm-hmm. Knowing where to go, and 
your backyard more often than not is not the right place to be investing. It's just that people have the familiarization with it and they have the confidence around it because they live in it and they love it. It makes them feel a bit more comfortable and warm. Yeah, they like to drive past and not walk into the property. And uh, there was one, there was one client, a uh, potential client. They were like, "Oh, we just want to, we want to manage it ourselves." I was like, "Okay, what are you looking for?" Well, we want good capital growth and good cash flow. It's like, okay. So you want everything. So you, you <laughs> well, if you want good capital growth and good cash flow. The data's not pointing you to buying that, that asset. Yeah. Um, however, you know, people, you, I don't get in their way. If they want to do a certain thing, then mm-hmm. go go off and do it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not advising on, on doing those strategies unless I absolutely wholeheartedly believe in that location and that property type, and that's what I say. You can only uh, lead a horse to water, right? Like, you oh, can yeah. share with them that, like, yeah, this... Like this is probably the best way to go for your goals. Um, it's up to you to make the decision, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the the pros and cons of capital growth, and yeah, so it goes in the hand in hand with cash flow. Yeah, let's bring it on. So the cons of cash flow. Oh, let's go to the pros. The pros of cash flow is like the dollars in the bank. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Every you week. To, yeah. And the more money in your bank account, the better, because then you can invest faster and into into anything and also borrowing capacity it's pretty good with the borrowing capacity right yep with banks are assessing your personal income and your investment income with your borrowing capacity for a future future purchase Mm -hmm. so very very powerful stuff and i i guess yeah the cons and pros of of both is that the cash flow is more guaranteed by you've had if you buy something you you know what it's going to rent for, roughly it's going to rent for, and that's going to happen the day you buy it. Yeah. Or once you get a tenant in there, which is a, a week or two weeks after it settles. So that's guaranteed. Whereas the capital growth, you know, that's hitting on the crystal ball stuff where yeah. you know, projections, whilst the projections of hoping it to grow and you don't know how fast it's going to grow or not grow. Yeah. You and buy shit asset. I mean, obviously, that's why we spend a lot of money on data um, and talk to a lot of people in around that, that sphere to give us confidence mm-hmm. and understand historical price patterns and, and movements to give us confidence into these ne- these new areas we're looking into. But if something were to happen, say, let's look at the COVID-19 pandemic, epidemic. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> um, no one saw that coming. Well, yeah. General public didn't see that coming, and <laughs> we got, uh, we got. <laughs> they, you, you know, like the you, the mindset of people at that stage was a lot of fear. I mean, just put your mind back to it. There was everything on the news was basically indicating that the world's going to end, and then after that, there was a war in Russia and Ukraine, and then um, we, then we had remember the toilet paper issue. Oh. People were just, you know, it was kind of a real reflection on. Our species, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then people taking like five big rolls of toilet paper, and it's kind of it that was concerning in my eyes. yeah, well, it it was right. You think when a time of crisis, people would band together, but the separation was it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So well, yeah, we went there. But we probably shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so the point being is that you know through those times, even global financial crisis dot-com bubbles, 90s recession, like it's, these things do happen and a lot of it is out of the control of, you know, the general public and what we know, right? There's bigger powers at play that have more ideas of how the world works and unfortunately, we don't have trillions and billions of dollars to help push the markets in different ways. Like, like unless you know someone who works for... Yeah, yeah, the Fed, JP Morgan, uh, all those, uh, BlackRock, love them. Uh, dropping a few names. Yeah, you've made people a lot of money. You've also lost people a lot if of money. If you do know them, do a few email intros to us. Yeah, yeah let us know. I'd love to going. interview them. Yeah. Let's see their, their, their <laughs> mindset on the on where the market's going. but Or yeah. where they're going to push the market. Well, yeah, you've got you to delve deeper into the, the details for yeah. these things. Like yeah. Even uh, yeah, this Reserve Bank in Australia, their commentary around where interest rates are going and all that, like it's, you've got to, by doing, by looking at it every single month and understanding the rhetoric that goes behind it, you start to see patterns. Um, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, point being, crystal ball, no one's got one. If something can happen, the market can pull back. But That's the pro of cash flow is like you don't know what growth you're going to get um, out of capital growth. But if you're going for cash flow, you know that you know, you're going to get your rent. Yeah. You're going to get the cash flow. In. Yeah. So that's pro. Because even if the world falls apart, you know, we're in a massively undersupplied housing market in Australia and people need somewhere to live. And that's just the, the way it is, right? They have to pay rent to, to have that shelter. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about cash flow is that you can rely on that. It takes the stress no matter what's happening in the world. So you're uh, getting money in the bank. Yep, it's paying your mortgage. Yep. Um, and, you know, it, if it's positively geared, it doesn't affect your lifestyle. Whereas you can go for a two, two month holiday, three month holiday, you could retire, you know. Yeah, with it, good cash flow. Yeah, you, that's 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 the goal, right? Is 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 to get people through um, the stage that they're doing playing the long game to get to the point where they're getting more cash flow assets and they can well, not more cash flow assets, but maybe a good blend of capital growth and cash flow, which we'll talk about different stages of a property portfolio soon and when to buy each of these different types of assets. But mm. yeah, well, that's, a, that's a good product. Yeah, the, like the, the biggest factor is you, you want to try and get the best of both worlds, right? Mm. Like you want good capital growth and cash flow. Um, if you had to choose, you have to understand where you are in your life. Yeah, before, before we get to that, can we just talk about the cons of cash flow? Cons of cash flow. Yeah. Often they are in more regional locations, which uh, are more affected by, I guess, m major market downturns. Uh, the more in terms of like market downturn, the property value, or the, prop you know, the value of the property would go down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no point in having great cash flow if the, if you bought it for five hundred grand now it's worth four hundred. That sucks. Yeah. And would that bring down rent as well? Uh, not necessarily, um, yeah. but it has potential. So the regional markets that like we invest in are backed by you know, multiple uh, diversified employment opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just those one trick mining towns. So just they're a classic example everyone leans to. And you know, with those mining towns, you're, you're getting great cash flow because a lot of businesses are putting their employees in there, they're renting out properties to get the works done around the area. People are moving there. They generally move to places first before buying because they want to either understand if that's where they want to be or are they just there to get a good paycheck for a few months or a few years and then move on. Mm -hmm. Is this what happened in the WA mining boom where people were like, uh, you know, how property prices went down in WA? Um, is that deal with they investing for cash flow? Yeah, well, the WA market is very uh, reliant on the the mining industry because it's just got such a big influence throughout that that region. It's and during the GFC, it was not as an established market as it is today. So um, there was pros and cons to the market in that they wanted like during the GFC region our time they were really prosperous. Like the mining, um, that's kind of what kept kept Australia afloat because all our exports were still really strong we're having good income but once those exports started to dry up and the ripple effects of a global financial crisis hit um, WA took a big bath mm -hmm. and it's only just started to come back now whereas a lot of other markets have been recovering since 2013 yeah. Um, so yeah the answer to your question is it was more susceptible to um, those pullbacks mm -hmm. and because it was so heavily reliant on that mining when it did fall back, it it, it affected the whole property industry in that region. Hugely, hugely. Yeah. So what other cons do we have when with cash flow? It's pretty much most of them really is um yeah with the the cash flow too, uh, you need to be aware of what your market rents are because you could buy an asset that has that strong cash flow. Um, but if that tenant moves out, you want to be able to ensure that a new tenant will move in and pay the same or more um, rent. You don't want it to go back in price. So they're, they're the cons that people do buy for cash flow and then they're actually buying an asset that doesn't grow in value and if without that tenant in place, it's not really worth what you're willing to pay for it because you don't have that guaranteed income. Got ya. Got ya. So 
let's now talk about the different phases or you know of our lives and our property portfolio to when to go for cash flow and when to go for capital growth so for somebody starting out there in their property portfolio obviously they should just go for cash flow right <laughs> oh starting out in your, in your journey i kid guys i kid if you don't if you don't see the joke by video um, yeah the first property is typically if you're younger in, in, if you're in your younger years and you want to start a property portfolio typically you're going to go for capital growth properties right yeah well capital growth but also if you're younger too you might not have that stronger income so you that balance between both okay um once again it's always that's why you need to sit down and talk with someone to understand what best suits your your life goals mm -hmm. and your position so there's no point in investing uh, at the younger age for just cash flow or just for capital growth you want to get the best of both worlds uh, when you're younger because you have that fancy to earn that money and pay that debt down uh, and if you go for just capital growth then more times out of more often than not you don't have those higher income levels because you are younger to help grow your portfolio. So you could have that one and done situation and then you just, you obviously get good capital growth, but you will always struggle to go for number two, which is going to help fast track your, your goals to financial buying independence. Another, buying another property. Yep. Yeah. Um, because that cash flow, that mix of cash flow and capital growth is going to allow you to get a little bit of cash flow that's going to help you with the borrowing capacity to go again, right? Correct. Versus if you just bought high capital growth and it grew in, grew in value, you still might be struggling even though you got equity to get borrowing capacity, right? Yep, yep, yep. pretty much. So the first one that you basically want a bit of a mixture. Yeah, ideally in um, getting the best of both worlds because that's going to help you from yeah, pull equity out in the future but also have the cash flow to, to go again. Uh, and then... Depends on where you're at with your portfolio too. So in the middle stages of your life, if you're if you're just starting your journey, it's all a chess game, right? So you want to set yourself up for that success, and the middle path of both capital growth and cash flow is really important. And then those that start to grow their portfolio, you'll start to see they'll either debt will start to be paid down and rents will increase, or um, they've got higher cash flow properties in their portfolio. And then you can go, well, because you've got good cash flow being generated, you can now go for that more you know, capital growth play in that um, less risky location of your major CBDs or, or minor CBDs, central business districts, cities, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can, so you, you're balancing it out as you go. And then in the latter periods of your life, it's you're really hunting for cash flow. So ideally, you'd like to have paid down that debt over the time so those properties are actually giving you good cash flow that you bought 10 years ago mm -hmm. and then pulling equity out of those to then go into a high income play like a commercial or a, a multi-income residential complex like unit complex like where you can buy four townhouses or something like that you control the whole site um, really great income play and yeah then that's what you're retiring on at the end of the day is, is cash is cash yeah you, because you can, if, put it this way, if you retired and you had your property portfolio and the income from the rents was just paying off the, the final remainder of debt and your maintenance <laughs> and your rates and all that, what are you living off? Yeah, you can't, you don't want to pull equity out because then you're taking uh, money from and that you're paying, yeah, it's debt, you're just increasing your debt, yeah. your cash, and it's going to cost you more to use that money because you've got an interest rate that you need to repay back, right? Because you've just gone for high capital growth properties alone without the mixture of cash flow. Yep. And then, I mean, there's a, the sell down strategy is always wise as well. So a big part of what we do is help people find the best real estate agents to sell assets in areas that have peaked or are plateauing. Mm -hmm. And then you can use that in order to buy that next asset that best suits your portfolio whether it's a capital growth or it's an income play mm -hmm. so you're just assessing uh opportunity costs of where the properties are that you've got in these different locations which ones are peaked which ones aren't performing as well sell down a few and either maybe buy some more or sell down a few and, and pay a little bit less um 
in finance fees because you pay down some mortgages. Yeah, yeah. I did a strategy the other day actually, which was uh, it's the same um, property acquisition phase where three residentials, one commercial, and you will get to a greater, you know, your, your income target will be faster if you buy the, the residentials, get that growth, sell the residentials down to then buy that one commercial the risk in that is you know all your eggs are in that one commercial basket mm -hmm. uh, from an income perspective um, however you won't have that that higher level of debt so you'll be able to basically fast track to get to that income um, target mm -hmm. the next stage of that would be well you've now got your strong income you've hit that retirement goal of a hundred thousand passive income it's still good to have an you know a capital growth asset within your portfolio. So look, let's look to go again to a residential to help marry it out. Yeah. Um, but that will get you a lot faster to that income goal. If you want to take the slower route, then it just buy and hold and you know, buy those three residentials, buy the commercial. At the end of the 30 year period, you're going to have, oh, what was the equity? It was about $2 million difference in equity. So you have more asset value, which you can pass on to your friends, family, whatever your legacy plans are, but it'll take you longer to get to that cash flow um, goal of $100,000 because you still, you carry that debt all the way through. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, versus like if you've got two or three properties selling them off and then buying just a commercial that's a higher cash flow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so pros and cons and everyone's got a different risk appetite for it and it also comes down to what the actual asset is that you're buying to give you confidence because mm. You can have a higher higher risk of in like an income play, say the commercial, but if that's a multi tenanted commercial property, then you're de risking that as well because you've got say four tenants and your income split between four different tenants. Yep, and then yeah. you're analysing those businesses that are renting it. You're seeing you know what their track record is. Yep, and one one maybe moves out, you can do some renovations to that tenancy and and then get a higher rent. So. Yeah, generally the, the big, I mean, all your, all, a lot of the real estate investment trusts run the commercial play because it, you're still getting that solid, you know, um, property asset. It's going to grow in value over time. Generally, it doesn't grow as fast as um, residential because it's more of a business income play. But, you know, it's a, a lower, mm, there's lower maintenance because your tenants are paying your outgoings. Yeah, um, there's longer leases. Yeah, longer leases, usually they're five or three to five years. Um, you can get people on 10 years and you can also have a lot of confidence in the business that's renting you the property because you, you do your due diligence on that actual company. Wow, so many different ways to grow the portfolio with a mixture of capital growth and cash flow. Yeah, so which assets are best for capital growth? Your yeah, low set of houses. Yeah, high land. Up. Land, high, or high, brick, brick houses with land, right? Well, <laughs> not just brick anymore, but it's just your, your strong owner-occupier appeal properties. So finding in those cul-de-sacs or those um, well-built-out locations that are desirable by the majority of people, yeah. they're going to grow well in value because they're more desired by most people, right? Yeah, yeah. more people want to live there. And you've got lower supply risk because... It's harder to buy to build a house than oh, it's harder to uh, it's harder to build a house than it is to build a unit. Mm -hmm. So you, any unit you get, you've got higher supply there. Mm -hmm. um, and then for cash flow, you got your higher income plays. Like the rooming house plays are really interesting. There's definitely caution around that in that um, because you. I'm just thinking we've got to get your friend on to talk about that. Yeah, your friend from uh, Geelong. No. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, if you listen to this one, we're coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, her and her uh, partner, Brian, are were really um, influential in that space and can definitely shed some light on it. So we'll get them on the pod and yeah. I'll do the ch chin wag. Yeah, I think we've covered a serious amount in this pod. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a, bit of a data dump on my brain into this and... Um, I mean, a lot of it's common sense, right? People are sitting there going, well done, that's, well, duh. But others, you know, you you just don't, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And to have that clarification, hopefully it, it does help. Um, <laughs> I think it helps. I think it's really beneficial to know, like, when to buy different those different assets and what those different assets look like through your property portfolio. 
and it's going to change between every single person. It's going to change between the job you have, the income you have, where you're at in your phase of life, your risk tolerance, your borrowing capacity, um, and what your goals are as well. Like there's so many variable factors. So yeah, if you do have questions, hit us up. Like we're here to help. Hello at propertypals.au and leave comments, subscribe, all those you know, marketing, social media things to get the name out there. But the reason why we do it is because it helps to, uh, yeah, helps other people learn and grow as well. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you the next one.